Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Greetings to you all. Welcome to the Precision Oncology course and today we are going to be doing personalized therapy for breast cancer. Let us look at the global scenario of breast cancer. Breast cancer is the most common malignancy among women globally. So there is an estimated 2.3 million new cases, incident cases and it represents about 11.7 percent of all cancer cases. So, there are racial and geographical differences which exist in the incident rate of breast cancer. There is a higher incidence of breast cancer among the Caucasian women uh, compared to the women of other races in Northern America and Western Europe compared to Asia and Africa. Breast cancer incidence is increasing almost in all ethnicities in the United States and the estrogen receptor positive breast cancer incidence is increasing across all ethnicities. So it is the leading non-dermatological malignancy. It is the leading non-dermatological malignancy and the second most common cause of cancer deaths among women in the United States. Although the overall death rates from the breast cancer is continuing to decrease since 1989, but still the death rate remains disproportionately high for women in some countries. If you look at the scenario of breast cancer in India, according to the National Cancer Registry program analyzed data from the cancer registries from a period of 1988 to 2013, looking at the incidence of uh, breast cancer, all the population based cancer registries are showing a significant increasing trend in the breast cancer. So if you look at the information from the Bangalore registry, it is about 23 percent versus 15.9 percent. So here 23 percent is breast, 15.9 percent is cervix. Similarly, Bhopal is 23.2 percent versus 21.4 percent. Chennai reports 28.9 percent of breast cancer versus 17.7 percent of cervix and Delhi 21.6 percent versus 20.3 percent. So by the years of 2000 to 2003, the scenario is still changing because the breast is clearly overtaking cervix and it is becoming the leading site of cancer in all the registries except the uh, rural registry of Barshi. So in case of breast cancer, there is a significantly increasing trend that we are observing in Bhopal, Chennai and Delhi registries. Now as we all saw, breast cancer is the most common cancer among women in India and it accounts for 27 percent of all cancers in women. And the breast cancer mortality rates in India is about 1.6 to 1.7 times higher than the maternal mortality rates. So Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Delhi have the highest rates of breast cancer and the late detection uh, of breast cancer reduces the survival rate by 3 to 17 times and that is why it is so important to detect breast cancer early. In 2017, India had the highest mortality rates globally for breast cancer. So one woman among 28 women are likely to develop breast cancer during their lifetime and 2000 new women are diagnosed with cancer every day and 1200 of these are detected at the later stage. So looking at the early detection modalities, early detection and treatment are therefore crucial to improve the breast cancer outcomes and survival rates. Awareness of early signs and symptoms and periodic screening are the cornerstones of early detection. Identifying the right cohort and high risk patients will lead to cost effective and successful programs for breast cancer early detection and prevention. The sensitivity and the specificity of the breast self examination are limited in detecting early breast cancer lesions. So, there is a manual presented here to do a breast self-examination. But however, 
this breast self examination has to be learnt properly from a health worker or from a clinician and it should be practiced by women re at regular intervals. Self examination has been shown to empower women in some studies. The other early detection modality is mammography. Early detection through screening and advances in treatment has contributed to 39% of mortality reduction in the United States since 1990. The NCCN guidelines for the breast cancer screening and diagnosis recommend annual mammographic screening for average risk which begins at the age of 40 years. Mammographic screening and subsequent treatment can reduce the breast cancer mortality. The combined analysis of several randomized control trials primarily conducted in the northern Europe have shown significant mortality reduction of approximately 20 percent among the invited women in the age group of 39 to 74 years. Most mammography screening programs uh, focus on the low risk women aged 50 to 69 years with screening every other year. The participation rate of mammography is over 66.5 percent in the United States, but we should have some ways to improve this in India. So, population based mammographic screening of asymptomatic post menopausal women have shown a modest reduction in the breast cancer deaths in high incidence affluent western countries, but it is associated with over diagnosis and over treatment as well. The population wide mammographic screening program for asymptomatic women is neither feasible in India nor useful due to the lower age during the breast cancer diagnosis and the vast population structure in India. So, therefore, a population wide screening for a huge population of India will not be very cost effective. So, the opportunistic screening may be considered for some high risk and concerned women in India. Periodic physical examination of breast by trained health workers along with health education is being compared with only health education in an ongoing NIH sponsored randomized trial which is happening in Mumbai. Breast self examination of women may help in identifying breast tumors earlier, but there was no reduction in the breast cancer mortality in one of the randomized trial which was conducted for breast self examination versus no intervention. So, the breast cancer can be assessed only clinically and a palpable breast mass is evident in about 30 percent of women who present with breast cancer. There can also be visible signs associated with breast cancer which include dimpling and orange peel uh, appearance on the skin which is called as POD orange. There can be erythema, edema, blistering, discharge from the nipple and nipple retraction. All these are the some of the visible signs which has to be assessed clinically. The clinical changes such as the POD orange and blistering are strongly associated with the inflammatory type of breast cancer. For staging of breast cancer, the American Joint Committee on Cancer which is called as the AJCC manual should be followed. The manual includes separating the anatomic and the prognostic staging group systems for breast cancer reflecting the importance of biomarkers in the breast cancer prognosis and treatment decisions which is based upon the state of the tumor biology. So, there is a traditional anatomic staging groups which includes the TNM or the which is the tumor size. A nodal status and metastasis that is what the TNM stands for and should only be used in the regions of the world where biomarker tests are not routinely available. So, if the biomarkers are available it should be along with the TNM staging and the biomarkers together should be used for right clinical assessment. So, if you look at the workflow which is followed for diagnosis of breast cancer first one is the assessment of the general health status. So, where the doctor takes the history of the patient, the menopausal status, physical examination is done, a flu full blood workup is needed, renal function tests, liver function tests and cardiac function tests are done 
in patients and uh, along with the alkaline phosphatase and calcium. After the blood workup is done, then there it is assessment of the primary tumor. The assessment of the primary tumor happens by physical examination, mammography, the breast ultrasound and breast MRI is also requested in certain cases. Once the, the lump is identified, then there is a core biopsy which is taken. The core biopsy with the pathology determination of the histology, the grade, the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, the HER2 receptor and KI67 is routinely followed. After the assessment of the primary tumor, then comes the assessment of regional lymph nodes where again the, the assessment happens by physical examination, ultrasound and ultrasound guided biopsy is done if the nodes are suspicious. Then the next is to assess whether there is metastatic disease present or not. So, the metastatic disease is again assessed by physical examination and there can also be other tests that are not routinely recommended unless there is a very high tumor burden and aggressive biology or when symptoms suggestive of metastasis are present and these are as per the ESMO clinical practice guidelines. Imaging is the foundation of the anatomic staging in breast cancer. So, for determination of the anatomic stage, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network NCCN advises performing a history and physical examination and a bilateral mammography and ultrasound as warranted. There has to be a pathology evaluation and assessment of the hormone receptors. Breast MRI is deemed optional with tumors that are mammographically occult. So, if the, if the breasts are extremely dense or if the mammography is occult, then it can warrant a special kind of consideration to order a breast MRI. Imaging studies are deemed elements of staging when performed within 4 months of the diagnosis and upon completion of surgery, whichever gives a longer interval provided the patient's disease is not progressed. So, if you look at the breast cancer categories, they can fall under an operable breast cancer category OBC or it can be a large operable breast cancer LOBC or it can be a locally advanced breast cancer LABC and or a metastatic breast cancer which we call as MBC. Now, let us see what they mean. So, the operable breast cancers are the cancers which fall under the T1 and T2 N0 to 1 and M0. So, these fall under the operable category and where when you say T1 to T2 that means the primary tumor size is up to 5 centimeters without the skin and the chest wall involvement that is when you call a tumor as T1 or T2. Then comes the N0 to 1 that is it should have a clinically uninvolved axilla and mobillary axillary nodes. So, your axillary lymph node should not be positive and then M0 means no metastatic disease during the relevant investigative workup. So, when uh, the tumor falls under these categories, it falls under the category of operable breast cancers which means the patients can undergo straight surgery. Then the next type comes the large operable breast cancer LOBC. So, the, the tumors within the uh, stage of T3, N0 to 1 and M0 fall under this category. So, when you say T3, that means the primary tumor size is greater than 5 centimeters without the skin or the chest wall involvement. So, anything above 5 centimeters come under the T3 category and then you have the N0 to N1 which means clinically uninvolved axilla or the mobility ax mobile axillary nodes and M0 is there is no metastatic disease on investigative workup. So, T3 tumors fall under the large operable breast cancer category. Then comes the locally advanced. The locally advanced breast cancer, the T4 stage and N, the N2 to 3 and M0 fall under the category of LABC. So, when you say T4, it can be the primary tumor can be of any size, but it when the skin and the chest wall is involved, then they become locally advanced. Similarly, the number of nodes are more. So, you have more matted and fixed axillary nodes and you can also have supraclavicular or the internal mammary nodes may be present. Then they come under the LABC category and M0 still there is no metastasis. So, metastasis uh, disease is not present during the investigative workup. So, these categories fall under the locally advanced breast cancer. 
The fourth category is the metastatic breast cancer where it can be any T stage, any N stage, but should present with distant metastasis. So, that is when the uh, breast cancers fall under the category of MBCs. So, all women who are presenting with a breast lump should undergo the triple test. Now, what is our this triple test mean? Triple test means the first one is the clinical examination which is uh, done by an experienced uh, breast surgeon or a clinician. Second aspect is the breast imaging. So, you have a bilateral mammogram that is mammography of both the breasts or ultrasound or MRI as appropriate. So, breast imaging is absolutely mandatory. The third aspect is the histopathology. So, for histopathology, we, need, we do a fine needle aspiration cytology or a core biopsy. Core biopsy is more ideal because the tissue conformation of the lesion is absolutely mandatory and incisional biopsy also can be done as indicated. Now, based on the clinical examination and appropriate the breast imaging, the lump can be classified as either cystic lump or a solid lump. Now, based on the index of suspicion for malignancy, so the what are the indexes of suspicion is the age, age of the women, the kind of clinical finding, the family history of the patient or previous breast cancer uh, biopsy findings. So, these are some of the uh, factors which increase the suspicion for breast cancer and solid lesions can be further categorized as benign or suspicious for cancer. So, this will be the basis of their further evaluation. So, first you identify a lump and then you have to decide whether it is cystic or solid and then after whatever type it falls under that, then you have to again decide whether it is benign or whether it is malignant. So, if for cystic lumps that is by breast ultrasound followed by a clinically guided ultrasound guided cyst aspiration, the cyst is uh, undergoes aspiration. So, you kind of take out the cells from the cyst and the women with small multiple cyst or if there is a clear fluid on aspiration, so these can be observed under the microscope. So, one can do a cytology or the histopathology evaluation and uh, on these cysts and then they can evaluate whether it is complex or hemorrhagic and then they can uh, kind of refill rapidly to have a residual lump. So, we can see whether this cyst can you know again get refilled or they can lead to a residual lump in future. So, these kind of assessment needs to be done from a cystic lump. Then it can be solid benign. So, now it is solid, the, the lump is solid which means it should be evaluated with breast imaging and excision biopsy needs to be done if it is a solid lump. That means it is still not malignant but the lump is still solid, so which means it will need a biopsy. Then comes suspicious solid, suspicious solid should again be evaluated by breast imaging or and if on imaging the lump is still suspicious then it should be evaluated with cytopathology or the histopathology to look at the morphology of the cells to conclude if it is malignant. So, staging of breast cancer as I mentioned is as per the AJCC manual, it should be followed, the latest addition should be adhered to. The manual includes separate anatomic and prognostic staging workup systems for breast cancer which reflects the importance of biomarkers in the breast cancer prognosis and treatment decisions. That is the uh, which actually explains the state of the tumor biology. So, significant uh, uh, you know anatomic staging groups which includes only the TNM that is the tumor size, the nodal status and the metastasis categories should now only be used in regions of the world where the biomarker tests are not routinely available. Now, let us look at what are all the tests which are normally ordered. Uh, when a breast cancer workup happens. So, because breast cancer is prone to a systemic spread, the probability of which increases with the tumor size, local infiltration and lymph node metastasis, it is important to look at the different markers. So, first is the routine blood test that is the CBC and biochemistry happens for all the three categories whether it is operable breast cancer or whether it is uh, large operable or locally advanced or metastatic all the types undergo the patients have to undergo the routine test. This is basically to assess the fitness for anesthesia and the chemotherapy. Next comes the breast imaging. 
The breast imaging definitely needs to be in place for the operable breast cancers and the locally operable, uh, locally advanced and the large operable. But in case of metastasis, it is selected. If it is clinically indicated, then uh, breast imaging is done. So, what are all the imaging modalities? As I mentioned, bilateral mammography uh, and then ultrasound and MRI. So, these are the three different imaging modalities which are practiced. Then comes the cytologic or the histopathological confirmation of diagnosis. So, this is necessary for all the three types. So, therefore, all the breast cancer types need to undergo a tissue confirmation using histopathology and here the histopathology is normally done on a core biopsy or it can be an FNAC or it can be an incision or the excision biopsy. So, core biopsy is the preferred method in all cases and it is mandatory if the new adjuvant systemic therapy is planned for histological grading and receptor status. So, to mark the uh, you know site of the primary tumor, the core biopsy should be centered over the tumor. Then FNAC is again acceptable in cases with clinical and mammographically evident cancer planned for upfront surgery. So, wherever mammographically it is completely evident, there FNAC can be done. And then you have the incision and the excision biopsy. So, whenever there is a high clinical suspicion, then you can have a repeat FNAC or the core biopsy is when it is negative. If your FNAC and the core biopsy is negative, then one goes for incision of the excision biopsy. So, there are certain receptor studies which are mandatorily done for all the breast cancer patients. So, you have do one looks at the ER and the PR status that is the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor. So, this is normally done for all the breast cancers whether it is operable or large operable or locally advanced or metastatic we need to know the receptor status whether they fall under the ER, PR positive case or whether it falls under the HER2 positive. So, this receptor uh, it is mandatory to do this. So, for ER and PR, uh, immunohistochemistry is normally done and one looks at greater than 1 percent of tumor cells which is staining for estrogen receptor is considered to be ER positive. And for HER2, that is uh, again it is done for all the breast cancer cases and this is more relevant for targeted therapy using trastuzumab and it is a feasible, it can be a feasible standard IHC for HER2 expression and if IHC is equivocal then it should be like more than 2 plus then one has to confirm the finding using FISH. So, next is the chest x-ray. It is done for all the different types of breast cancers and uh, then bone scan is done. So, normally for the operable breast cancers they do not do, but for the large operable and the locally advanced the breast uh, the and the metastatic breast uh, bone scan is normally done. So, if you have a raised alkaline phosphatase or the bone symptoms, any kind of a bone pain or a sign, then bone scan is recommended. If the bone, can, bone scan is not feasible due to various logistical or the healthcare provision issues, then one has to look at the uh, you know skeletal survey and they have to do it especially if it is if the patient is symptomatic. So, breast imaging is done for all the types of breast cancer, all the different breast cancer categories, operable breast cancers, large operable breast cancers, locally advanced breast cancers and metastatic breast cancers. All the women undergo bilateral mammography and then ultrasound is done for cystic or benign in young women and then MRI is prescribed for women with dense breasts that is especially in younger women and young women are at risk due to the BRCA mutation positivity which is prior to the breast reconstruction. So, therefore, MRI is done in such women. And then there is histopathological and cytological confirmation where a core biopsy is done, FNAC is done, uh, one can do incision or the excision biopsy. Looking at the ER, PR and the HER2 status becomes mandatory, the chest x-ray and bone scan are also indicated. So, breast cancer diagnostic evaluation and staging workup. So, looking at the uh, other tests which are normally done. So, one does ultrasound abdomen which is done for the locally advanced and LABC and uh, as well as metastatic breast cancer. So, if your uh, LFT is abnormal and uh, then uh, definitely this is mandatorily it has to be done and but it is not required if your CT thorax or abdomen is being performed. And then, uh, then you do a CT thorax and abdomen which is again recommended for the large operable breast cancers and locally advanced breast cancers and metastatic breast cancers. So, purpose is if your LFT is abnormal, 
if there are suspicious symptoms or if the CT scan is not feasible due to various logistical or the healthcare provision issues, chest x-ray and IU, uh, ultrasound abdomen for staging are available still the CT, thorax and abdomen is mandated. One would also do FDG PET and CT scan um, uh, especially in selected cases especially useful if you have the standard imaging findings are equivocal. So, therefore, if they want to understand whether the disease has spread how much it has spread. So, as per the indication FDG PET and CT scan is recommended as well. Apart from this you have tumor markers. So, tumor markers is again uh, the clinical util utility of certain tumor markers like CA 15.3 etcetera is still not very well established. And then you also have the multi gene signature mama print oncotype DX prosigna type of multi gene signatures which are studied again it is uh, their clinical uh, utility is kind of adding it is bringing some value in the routine practice uh, in course of time it will be there in place and there is very little data from the Indian patient. So, therefore, it is important to um, do these kind of multi gene signature studies in the Indian breast cancer patients to understand the role of these uh, assays in, in depicting uh, prognosis. So, therefore, recently there is a test called as IHC 4 test where uh, one looks at the ER, PR, HER2 and the KI67 all the 4 markers and this seems to provide some useful information which is uh, advocated in research settings. Next we come to the management schema in the operable breast cancers as I mentioned T1 to T2 stages uh, N0 to 1 and M0. So, here based on the clinically operable breast cancer diagnosis uh, and after the histopathological confirmation and breast imaging as described, if the patient is uh, wishing and it is eligible for the breast conservation therapy, then the women are offered breast conservation therapy and which can be followed by adjuvant therapy. There can be a situation where a woman may want BCT that is breast conservation therapy, but may not be suitable for the same if her lesion is going to be greater than 4 centimeters tumor. So, in that case she may not be suitable for BCT. So, in that case she will undergo new adjuvant chemotherapy and then uh, there can be a reassessment which can happen after 4 to 6 cycles whether after that if the tumor is responding whether she can undergo a BCT or not. So, and then there is a again another category where women may not want a BCT or they may not be eligible as well. So, in those cases the women straight away undergo modified radical mastectomy which is MRM followed by adjuvant therapy. So, the new adjuvant or the adjuvant systemic therapy which is chemotherapy, hormone therapy and with along with biological agents are what is practiced and it is basically individualized as per the disease stage, as per the menopausal status, as per the receptor status and other prognostic and preventive the new. So, therefore, if you look at the treatment it is the new adjuvant, adjuvant systemic therapy which is a combination of chemotherapy, hormone therapy or uh, and the biological agents. So, the, it is individualized the, the, the therapy is individualized as per the uh, disease stage, uh, as per the menopausal status, as per the receptor status and other prognostic and predictive factors along with the tolerance, compliance, feasibility and cost benefit aspects of a particular approach. Along with this there is also adjuvant radiotherapy which is given. So, post operative radiotherapy usually after completion of chemotherapy is indicated in all patients who undergo breast conservation therapy and after the mastectomy if the T3 or if the positive if there are positive resection margins or if they have more than 3 nodes. So, under these circumstances and uh, post operative RT is also advised. So, uh, coming to the management schema in large operable or locally advanced breast cancer. So, here the patient will fall under the uh, category of T3 staging T3 or T3 to 4. So, and then there may have a node positive it can be N2 to 3 or N0 to 1. So, after the histopathological confirmation and breast imaging as mentioned earlier one has to undergo uh, the metastatic workup. 
Now, when one does a metastatic workup, you could have a metastatic disease or you need, may not have the metastatic disease. So, under circumstances when there is no metastatic disease, then the patient undergoes mastectomy with a primary skin closure. So, whether we have to see whether it is feasible to be done or it is not feasible to be done. If it is feasible to be done, then the MRM is done followed by adjuvant therapy. Uh, but if the patient wants to undergo BCT that is breast conservation, then they have to additionally undergo NACT that is neoadjuvant chemotherapy is advised in these patients with BCT. Similarly, if the patient is not uh, feasible to undergo an MRM, then they undergo the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. And then there is an assessment of response which happens after 4 cycles of chemotherapy. So, in responding patients that is who are able to complete all the uh, cycles of neoadjuvant chemotherapy before surgery or uh, um, that is if on these patients, uh, one can perform surgery after 3 to 4 cycles of chemotherapy and then give them the remaining therapy. So, initially you start with chemotherapy after 3 to 4 cycles you stop it, you perform the surgery and then uh, you allow the patient to recover and then you continue the remaining chemotherapy. So, that is also practiced. So, after this therapy is over then the uh, woman can be considered for MRM or it can be a BCT, so which is optional. So, after this there is a completion of chemotherapy and, uh, and adjuvant hormone therapy and radi radiotherapy can also be considered. If there is no response in the patient that is if they are not responding to chemotherapy then one has to undergo mastectomy or the second line chemotherapy based on the operability. So, after this they still have to undergo chemotherapy and adjuvant hormone therapy or radiotherapy accordingly. Now, let us see what are the risk factors of breast cancer in women increasing age, family histo history of breast cancer uh, is definitely important when the, the patient is diagnosed with the disease at a younger age. Next, let us look at the risk factors for breast cancer in women. So, increasing age is one of the factors. Then, family history of breast cancer which tends to make the woman present with breast cancer at a younger age. Then, genetic mutations such as BRCA or the BRCA2, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations fall under the genetic mutation category. And then you have the increased mammographic breast density, early menarche, late menopause, nulliparity, having no childbirth at all, older age at the first childbirth, increased body mass index BMI, history of atypical lobular hyperplasia or atypical ductal hyperplasia or previous uh, lobular carcinoma in situ or flat epithelial atypia. So, these kind of previous histories are also a risk factors for breast cancer among women. Prior breast biopsies and long term postmenopausal estrogen and progesterone replacement and prior thoracic radiation therapy at under the age of 30 are all some of the risk factors which can lead to breast cancer in women. Next, we talk about the hereditary breast cancer. Now, hereditary breast cancer uh, accounts for nearly 5 percent of all the breast cancers and uh, has a greater proportion of ovarian cancers as well. So, the germline mutations in uh, two breast cancer susceptibility genes called as the BRCA1 and BRCA2 account for uh, over 50 percent of the hereditary breast and the ovarian cancer which we call as HBOC families. Mutation in the P53 gene accounts for a small fraction of families which we call as the Lee-Fromini syndrome. So, if you look at the clinicopathological features of the hereditary breast cancer, the age of diagnosis is pretty young. So, it is a younger age at diagnosis which is nearly about 1 to 2 decades earlier. There is a greater propensity for multifocal involvement and there is a high probability of at least 50 percent for synchronous or the metasynchronous bilateral breast cancer. So, there is a probability of getting bilateral breast cancers and BRCA1 associated breast cancers have a very geni distinct genetic signature which we call as the basal type with preponderance of poorly differentiated estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor and HER2 negative tumors. So, therefore, it is um, call as a triple negative tumors. Triple negative means all the three receptors will be negative. So, many of the triple negative breast cancers uh, can have the BRCA associated BRCA1 mutation. 
So, therefore, genetic testing using the BRCA1 and 2 gene sequencing is recommended for women with a very strong family history of early onset breast cancer or ovarian cancer and then uh, can be calculated. Uh, so, therefore, it is important to uh, calculate the probability of finding a BRCA mutation is nearly genetic testing using the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene sequencing is recommended for women with a strong family history of early onset breast cancer or ovarian cancer or when the calculated probability of finding a BRCA mutation is greater than 10 percent. So, if the mutation uh, presence uh, is definitely having a high probability of greater than 10 percent, then genetic testing is mandatory among these women. So, a genetic risk assessment and referral for genetic evaluations should be considered if there is an early onset of breast or ovarian cancer and especially if it is a triple negative breast cancer. So, if, if a woman uh, is presenting with triple negative breast cancer and is in her you know early 30s or early 40s, then therefore, it can be considered as an early onset breast or the ovarian cancer and they need to undergo the genetic risk assessment. And then personal history of bilateral breast or bilateral ovarian cancers, then primary uh, the personal history of a primary breast cancer and ovarian cancer in the same individual then. Then the fourth category is personal history of breast and ovarian cancer along with the family history of one or more family members with breast, ovarian or some other cancer. So, when the cancer seems to be running in the family, then yes, they, their genetic risk should be assessed. A known BRCA1 or the BRCA2 mutation which is uh, studied in the, in the blood relative, then that also is, is becomes a uh, risk factor and then member of an ethnic community which uh, with uh, uh, founder BRCA1 or 2 mutation like the Ashkenazi uh, Jews they call it. So, if you are a member of a particular ethnic community where uh, there is a very high uh, preponderance of uh, BRCA1 and 2 mutation then yes genetic risk assessment is necessary for these women. Any women concerned about their hereditary cancer, if suppose cancer is running in their families and a woman is concerned about it and wants a genetic risk assessment to be done, then yes, she is eligible to get this done. Screening for women from the HBOC families or known BRCA mutation carriers should start at the age of 25 years or 5 years before the youngest affected member in that family, whichever is earlier. So, therefore, screening is recommended for these women. If a woman is a BRCA mutation carrier, then the, her screening should be nearly 25 years early and it should start at the age of 25th year and then or it should be 5 years before the youngest family member in there has got affected. Whichever is earlier, they have to start and then they have to undergo monthly self, exa self breast examination, uh, 6 monthly clinical breast examination and they have to undergo an annual breast imaging in experience centers and MRI actually has a higher sensitivity of detecting breast cancer in such women. So, they can be advised to undergo MRI with no clear benefit of ovarian cancer in, with the transvaginal ultrasound or CA125, this is routinely not recommended. So, mutations in the BRCA1 gene which is present in the chromosome 17q21 and BRCA2 which is present in the chromosome 13q12 to 13q13, they are responsible for nearly 85 percent of the hereditary breast cancers. Now, these genes are involved in DNA repair. So, therefore, there are specific mutations in BRCA1 and BRCA2 and they are more common in women of the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. So, overall prevalence of disease related mutation in BRCA1 has been estimated at 1 in 300 whereas BRCA2 is a, about 1 in 800 women. So, the cumulative risk estimates for developing breast cancer by the age of 80 years is 72 percent for BRCA1 carriers and 69 percent for BRCA2 carriers. The cumulative risk of a contralateral breast cancer that is 20 years after the first breast cancer is identified 20 years later the cumulative risk of developing the contralateral breast cancer is 40 percent for the BRCA1 mutation carriers and it is 26 percent for the BRCA2 mutation carriers. So, BRCA related breast cancer is more likely to be triple negative particularly in the setting of BRCA1 mutation. So, therefore, if a woman is BRCA positive, 
then most likely her, uh, the very high chances of her uh, um, cancer to be a triple negative type. Indications of genetic testing. Now, all patients should have a basic assessment for the risk of hereditary breast or ovarian cancer syndrome including uh, documentation of personal and family history that is both paternal and maternal sites of malignancy should be documented. All patients with a high risk of hereditary syndrome based on the personal or the family history or at the age of diagnosis, the age at which this diagnosis is made should undergo genetic counselling before undergoing the genetic test. So, before we undergo a genetic test, a genetic counselling should be offered to these patients. If genetic counselling visit is an important step, it is an important step in addressing patients goal of testing and it is an opportunity to address the misconceptions and limitations of genetic testing. So, for genetic counselling visit becomes mandatory under these circumstances. So, there are three possible outcomes of genetic testing of a BRCA mutation. So, it can either be positive or you can have a variant of uncertain significance or it can be negative. So, these three are the possible uh, genetic testing um, outcomes that one can have. It can be either BRCA positive or it can be a variant of uncertain significance or it can be BRCA negative. Next, let us see uh, what are all the breast cancer prevention strategies in, in families where this hereditary breast and ovarian cancer seems to be running. So, the options for cancer prevention in these high risk women include chemo prevention using tamoxifen or they can undergo a risk reducing salpingo-oophorectomy which is what is RRSO or they can be a bilateral prophylactic mastectomy BPM with reconstruction. So, these are all the different modalities which can be done. The most useful prophylactic procedure is the risk reducing salpingo oophorectomy where your ovaries are removed RRSO at the age of 35 to 40 years and after completion of childbearing if the ovaries are removed then the protection is better. This reduces the ovarian cancer risk by 99 percent and breast cancer by around 50 percent. Clinical trials of platinum agents and PARP inhibitors are underway for women with BRCA1 and 2 associated hereditary breast or the ovarian cancers. Now we have seen how the breast cancer is diagnosed, how it is uh, you know what are the different diagnostic modalities which are being followed and how the patients are managed, what is the working schema for uh, the clinical treatment of breast cancer then how breast cancers can be screened, how they can be prevented, all these we have seen. Next, we will go to the schematic representation of the breast cancer types. So, the breast cancer can be either non-invasive. So, whenever it is in situ, that is it is localized to a particular place, it has not breached the basement membrane and gone ahead, then it becomes a non-invasive that is an in situ cancer. So, it is still non-invasive. So, you can have a lobular carcinoma in situ when it is involving the lobules or it can be a ductal carcinoma in situ when it is involving the ducts and then it can be a invasive cancer. Invasive cancer means it is spread, it is it is breached the basement membrane and it is spread into the stroma. So, you can have a lobular carcinoma or you could have a ductal carcinoma. There are also other types of breast cancer. You can have a male breast cancer, you can have inflammatory breast cancer, you can have Pages disease. These are also types of other types of breast cancer. So, the breast cancer is normally classified as per its anatomical origin. Uh, that is what either it can be a ductal type or it can be a lobular type and then its hormone receptor status is very important. We have to ascertain whether it is ERPR positive or ERPR negative along with HER2 status. So, all these becomes mandatory. Next, we go to the classification of breast cancer. So, among the breast cancers as I mentioned one has to look at the receptors that is whether it is ERPR positive or negative. So, among the ERPR positive uh, types you have again two types the luminal A and the luminal B. So, these are the subtypes. So, when you call a particular breast cancer to be luminal A then it is estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive and HER2 negative. So, the, the essentially the luminal A means ERPR positive cases can be either luminal A or luminal B. So, if the patient's tumors fall under the luminal A category, then the prognosis is seemingly good. 
So, the most it is so luminal A type is the most common subtype and it is uh, usually the, the tumors are of lower grade and uh, they are diagnosed at early stages and it is responsive to therapies such as the SERMs that is selective estrogen receptor modulators and aromatase inhibitors and it has the lowest rate of recurrence. The luminal A subtype has the lowest rate of recurrence. The next is the luminal B. Luminal B is also estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive. HER2 can be either positive or negative. So, here the prognosis is fair that is they tend to be of higher grade. It is more aggressive compared to luminal A. So, therefore, the, the tumors are of higher uh, uh, grade basically and they can recur more frequently than luminal A. The third category is the HER2 positive. The HER2 positive types are estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative but they are HER2 positive. So, the Herceptin is the uh, therapy that is given to these women. So, the HER2 receptor is positive among the HER2 that is why they fall under the HER2 type. So, some tumors may be amenable to anti-HER2 monoclonal antibody, but not all tumors respond to anti-HER2 monoclonal antibodies. So, therefore, the resistance can develop in, in most patients to anti-HER2 monoclonal antibodies, particularly strastuzumab. So, those, uh, though this is given to the patient, they can eventually become resistant to this treatment. Then the fourth type is the triple negative breast cancers where all the three receptors are negative that is ERPR is negative, HER2 negative. So, these fall under the triple negative category and again this the prognosis is very poor and this is more common among the black women and the age of diagnosis of the triple negative breast cancer is usually younger than the other subtypes. So, it is not amenable to hormonal therapy, it is not amenable to HER2 therapy and uh, the triple negative breast cancers tend to be aggressive with high rates of recurrence. Next, let us look at the genomic subtypes of breast cancer. So, breast cancer as we see is a very complex wide ranging heterogeneous disorder. So, therefore, there are different molecular and clinical subtypes which require distinct treatment plans. So, it is very important to ascertain their genomic subtypes. So, breast cancer has five molecular subtypes depending upon the differential gene expression. So, the first type is the luminal A where the, it can be ERPR positive, HER2 negative and KS67 negative. Luminal B will be ERPR positive, HER2 can be positive or negative, but KS67 will be positive. Then you have the HER2 type, HER2 type is ERPR negative, HER2 is high and then the basal type where ERPR, HER2 all the three are negative and then you have the KI67 is done. So, that may be positive and so that comes under the basal like type and then you have the normal like, normal like will be ERPR positive, HER2 negative and KI67 also negative. So, these come under the normal like patterns. So, therefore, normally the, the basal like that is a triple negative they say. So, that has a very high propensity to, to have a poor prognosis. So, normally triple negatives are not having very good prognosis and uh, so that is the they are uh, under the category of basal like features. Now, let us look at closely the luminal A and the B subtypes. The luminal A and the B subtypes express the genes which are associated with the luminal epithelial cells of the normal breast tissue and they overlap with the ER positive breast cancers as defined by certain clinical assays. So, this luminal A subtype accounts for nearly 40 to 50 percent of the breast cancers and it has the best prognosis. These tumors are generally ERPR positive and HER2 negative. Now, approximately 20 percent of the ERPR positive tumors fall under the luminal B subtype. And these have a worse prognosis compared to luminal A. Now, the luminal B subtypes includes tumors which are ERPR positive and HER2 negative as well as those that are ERPR and HER2 positive. So, they come under the luminal B. Luminal B cancers also tend to have a higher grade compared to luminal A cancers and luminal A cancers are generally responsive to endocrine therapy while the luminal B tumors may benefit with a combined approach of including both chemotherapy and endocrine therapy. So, if you look at the different intrinsic breast cancer subtypes which is uh, in relation to the mammary differentiation, so you see that the recurrence rate is pretty high for the triple negative breast cancers. Among the triple negative breast cancers, you still have some more subtypes like you have the BL1, then you have the IM, LAR, 
you know, the, and then uh, these are some of the subtypes which are present within the triple negative breast cancers and normally the recurrence rate is high for the triple negative breast cancers. Then you have the HER2 enriched and the luminal B and the luminal A. So, the luminal A have the best survivals and the triple negatives have the worst survivals. So, therefore, the mesenchymal property is also very high among the triple negatives. Uh, you know, so therefore, they, their morphology and their uh, expression profile is kind of similar to the stem cells. So, therefore, they are more aggressive in nature compared to the luminal or the epithelial cells where they are more well differentiated. So, the molecular subtyping can be done by histopathology as well. So, if you have a very high expression of uh, ER positive, then you know that uh, they fall under the luminal A category. So, if you have a very high positivity of estrogen receptor, then you know that most probably that tumor falls under the luminal A category. Along with this, when you do P53, so if you have a P53 positivity among the ERPR tumors, then it could fall under the luminal B category. Then you have the normal like, then and then you have the HER2. In case of HER2, the HER2 expression is very high. And then you can have a basal like. So, the basal like um, cancers can have uh, expression of EGFR, cytokeratin as well as P53. So, all these may be represented in a basal like uh, uh, type of basal type of breast cancer. And so, therefore, it is very important to uh, look at the molecular subtypes even if it is by histopathology, but it is still worthwhile to look at the molecular subtyping of breast cancer. Next, we are going to talk about the gene expression testing for breast cancer. So, we have seen that uh, looking at the molecular biomarkers are so very important to assess whether the breast cancer falls under the luminal A type or a luminal B type or HER2 type or triple negative type. So, whatever it is is dependent upon the expression of these biomarkers and this is something which we are doing with histopathology. But then now, there are gene expression tests which are available which can help us to prognosticate the risk of distant metastasis in, in breast cancer patients and also to identify women who are more likely to benefit from chemotherapy. So, therefore, the aim of these gene expression tests is to provide more accurate prognostic information than other non-genetic clinical pathological tests. Like for example, they, the clinical pathological tests uh, also are important for uh, prognosis, but the gene expression tests are able to give more accurate prognostic information uh, about specific molecular features pertaining to the woman's breast cancer that may indicate an increased likelihood for rapid growth or, or risk of metastasis and response to chemotherapy. So, all these three things can be identified with the help of molecular features. That is, what is the increased likelihood of rapid growth of tumor? In this, in this woman and then the risk of metastasis, what is the risk of metastasis and how she is going to respond to therapy, chemotherapy. All the three questions can be identified and answered by looking at the molecular features of the individual tumors. Now, these tests are typically performed after surgery in conjunction with other available information such as the tumor size and the grade. Now, they are typically used in, in women who are ER positive and lymph node negative tumors, but sometimes lymph node positive tumors are also taken if the number uh, and the involved lymph nodes are very low and if there is uh, uh, only micrometastasis, then we still take these lymph node positive tumors also for testing, but otherwise by and large we do it for ERPR positive and uh, lymph node negative tumors. So, as we saw, there are four different molecular subtypes of breast cancer. You have the luminal A. So, if it is luminal A, then you have ER, PR positive, HER2 is negative, the KI67 may be low and the prevalence is about 30 to 70 percent. So, that is the most common cancer. And if you look at the prognosis, it usually grows slowly over time and it has the best prognosis of all the subtypes. So, of all the four, this is a better uh, prognosis, has better prognosis. Then comes the luminal B category. So, in the luminal B category, the ER is definitely positive, the PR can be positive or negative, HER2 can be positive or negative, but the KI67 is very high. So, based on the KI67's expression only, the tumor is becoming aggressive. 
So, luminal B is generally more aggressive compared to luminal A and the prevalence is about 10 to 20 percent and it has a worse prognosis compared to luminal A. The third type is the HER2 enriched type where you have the ER is negative, PR is negative, only the HER2 is positive. So, it can be uh, you know the KI67 can be anything does not matter, but the prevalence is between 5 to 15 percent and it goes faster. So, a HER2 enriched tumor uh, actually grows faster than luminal A or the luminal B subtypes. Then the fourth subtype is the basal like or the triple negative where all the three receptors are negative then KI67 can be anything. It can have a high expression or a low expression, but still if the all the three receptors are negative, they falls under the basal like and this basal like type is often more aggressive as a poorer prognosis compared to luminal A and the B subtypes. So, now let's, let us look at the summary of these biomarkers which are used in treatment decision making. So, biomarker ER, estrogen receptor, how it is assessed? It is assessed with immunohistochemistry and uh, the positivity is taken if, if there is a greater than 1 percent expression then it is considered to be positive. For the progesterone receptor also it is done with immunohistochemistry and again it is positive if it is greater than 1 percent. Uh, for HER2 it can be immunohistochemistry and if it is positive then it has to be confirmed with FISH. And then uh, you can have if it is in situ hybridization, so if the FISH uh, can have a greater than 6 copies and uh, if it is a dual probe then accordingly the copy numbers which will also change. So, therefore, uh, the last is the last marker is the KI67 which is normally done. So, that is also studied with the uh, immunostochemistry and but there is no final consensus or cutoff. But the anything which is you know less than 10 percent is considered to be low and anything which is above 30 percent of expression is considered to be high. Now, here we see that you know this is an invasive uh, uh, lobular breast carcinoma which is a demonstrating a strong 3 plus estrogen receptor expression by immunohistochemistry in virtually all the tumor cells. So, all these are tumor cells and all this blue, blue brown stain that we see shows the expression of the estrogen receptor and we see that it is a very, very highly positive tumor. Now, this is an example of the ductal carcinoma in situ sample which is showing a heterogeneous ER expression by immunohistochemistry. Approximately if you see it is very heterogeneous expression. So, you have certain areas with a very weak expression, certain areas with intermediate and certain areas with a very strong uh, expression. So, as such in this in about 70 percent of the cells uh, are of tumor origin. So, you see that in certain areas it is weak 20 percent is weak, 20 percent is intermediate and 30 percent of the areas are strongly straining for the ER expression. Next let us look at what are all the current risk prediction options that we have. So, the standard practice after the surgical treatment of an early stage breast cancer is to administer adjuvant chemotherapy or hormonal therapy uh, to reduce the risk of distant metastasis. You do not want the disease to spread. So, therefore, the next option after surgery is to administer uh, chemotherapy or hormonal therapy according to the clinical, histological or the molecular characteristics of the tumor. So, along with this there are also online uh, prognostic tools available. So, there is a prognostic tool which is called as the predict tool or the Nottingham prognostic index. So, these are some of the online tools which are available. So, the predict tool is made freely available uh, through the UK's national health service and this particular tool it considers patients age mode of detection, tumor size, grade, ER status, number of lymph nodes positive, HER2 status, KI67 uh, status and the general chemotherapy regimen. So, when you feed in all these data into the tool then it is can it can predict the 5 to 10 year survival after this particular this data is given to the tool. And there is also another uh, tool which is called as the Nottingham prognostic index. So, this incorporates the tumor size, number of lymph nodes and tumor grade. So, the prognosis worsens as the NPI value increases and cutoffs are used to categorize the people into good, moderate and poor. So, we have to whenever we do a risk prediction, we have to say whether they fall under the good risk or the moderate risk or the poor risk. So, therefore, based upon the value which is generated, based upon a score which is being generated, so they can get categorized into the category of good, moderate or poor. Then you have this NPI plus basically is an ad adaptation of the NPI test and it is considered, uh, it considers the molecular phenotype of the breast cancer. 
and then you have another um, tool which is called as the adjuvant online so this adjuvant online is basically a free online tumor that that prognosticates a person's 10 year risk of distant recurrence and survival which is again based on age tumor size tumor grade er lymph node status is not like no longer available for example but uh, uh, in case if the lymph node status is no longer available it is still okay but uh, it can still the tool can still help prognosticate the 10 years year of uh, 10 years risk of distant recurrence and survival so there is a test called as mama print now this mama print was the first gene expression profiling test to uh, publish evidence of its use in the year 2002 so this particular mama print assay contains about 70 genes uh, which are identified from ap approximately 25,000 protein coding genes among the human genome and it is predictive of recurrence risk. So, when you say a low risk, it indicates uh, that the person on an average has a 10 percent chance of distant recurrence within 10 years without any additional adjuvant hormonal therapy or chemotherapy. And then the patient who come under the high risk category they have a chance of 29 percent so among the women with early stage breast cancer who were uh, who are having a high clinical risk and a low genomic risk of recurrence then the receipt of no chemotherapy on the basis of the 70 gene signature led to a five year rate of survival without distant metastasis which was like 1.5 percent points lower than the rate with the chemotherapy so that is the advantage of this particular test so next is the another type of uh, gene expression profiling test which is called as the oncotype dx this oncotype dx test evaluates 16 cancer related genes which were selected out of 250 possible genes based upon their prognostic ability and uh, the the consistency that it gives per test so the expression of these 16 genes genes is basically measured in triplicate so it is just not once you have to do it three times it's done in triplicates and then it is normalized relative to the five reference genes so in this test you have five reference genes which function as your internal controls and the patient sample will be run in triplicates so it's all run in triplicates and then you it is normalized with the expression of the reference genes so this test actually uses a proprietary algorithm to calculate the recurrence score and then categorizes the uh, patients having a high risk or a low risk or an intermediate risk. So therefore, uh, if it is a low risk people, if you are getting a low risk out of the Oncotype DX test, that means the benefit of chemotherapy may not be very large. So it's very small, so will not outweigh the risk of the side effects. Whereas in case of oncotype DX which is of high risk then the benefit of chemotherapy is likely to be greater than the risk of the side effects. So therefore it ha you one has to weigh the, the possibilities between the risk of the side effect versus the uh, benefit of chemotherapy. So these have to be weighed and then we have to take a decision. So the risk benefit calculation was originally uncertain for lymph node uh, intermediate risk people. However, based on the results of a very important trial which is called a style trailer X which is trial assigning individualized options for treatment trial that is the Taylor X trial by uh, Sparano et al. Oncotype DX results have now been changed into a two category risk. So, so it is it used to be intermediate low intermediate and high now it is only low which is less than 25 and high which is 26 to 100 for people greater than 50 years of age and with lymph node negative breast cancer. Next we are going to talk about another gene expression profiling test which is called as the ProSigna. This ProSigna test is formally known as the PAM50. PAM50 is the predictor analysis of microarray 50. This evaluates 50 genes. So, we saw that MAMA print was doing 70 genes, Oncotype DX had 16 genes, the ProSigna has 50 genes and it can distinguish between a molecular subtype of breast cancer that is whether it, whether it falls under the luminal A type or B type or HER2 type or basal type. So, that uh, 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 differentiation is possible with this test and then the tumors gene expression profile is compared with each of the four molecular types to determine the degree of similarity then the results are often combined with the risk of recurrence score that is they look at the proliferation score and tumor size to establish the ROR score which is called as the risk of recurrence score. 
The risk of recurrence score is uh, again correlated with the 10 year probability of distant recurrence with the risk groups which are categorized as low. So, if you get a score less than 10 percent then it is low, intermediate is between 10 to 20 percent and high is anything less higher anything higher than 20 percent falls under the high risk. So, based upon the risk of recurrence score the, uh, the patients get classified as low risk or the high risk. So, it is possible these days to offer molecular diagnostics for breast cancer using the nano string based risk prediction assay. So, this prosigna assay or the PAM50 assay can be done on the platform of nano string. So, to identify if the breast tumor comes under the category of luminal A or luminal B or basal like or HER2 enriched. So, these can be assessed by performing this particular PAM50 assay. So, the PAM50 subtypes and PAM50 proliferation have also been shown to uh, kind of predict the benefit of chemotherapy in women. So, to understand whether the woman will actually benefit out of chemotherapy or is she going to have more side effects out of chemotherapy, doing this test becomes mandatory for the ER, PR positive and HER2 negative patients with, the, with very less number of lymph nodes, just one lymph node or no nodes up to one node is possible. Be beyond that it is not recommended, this test is not recommended for them. But for all the early stage breast cancers, one can do the PAM50 testing and to understand the uh, type of uh, uh, intrinsic subtype they fall under as well as the, the risk score, the, the risk of recurrence score, the genomic risk score and the tumor inflammation signature. So, these three parameters will be obtained. Uh, you, when one uh, uses nano string for expression profiling of the breast tumors. So, next let us see how this breast cancer prognostication assay works. So, this BC360 as we call it is a 776 gene code set. So, it one in one sample uh, uh, one can study 776 genes and this is designed for profiling the tumor biopsies which can characterize the breast cancer specific gene expression patterns which is associated with the tumor, associated with the immune response, associated with the micro environment which impacts the tumor metastasis. So, all this information can be derived when this particular test is offered to the woman. So, what is BC360 and what is PAM50? So, the uh, nano string assays come under like encounter breast cancer 360 panel. So, there is an assay which is called as the encounter breast cancer 360 panel which is able to give a unique 360 degrees view of the gene expression of the breast tumors, its micro environment as well as immune response. So, it gives a complete information about the gene expression of the breast tumor, also the tumor micro environment and the immune response. So, this particular test can decode the complexities of the breast cancer biology, it can help us develop novel breast cancer gene signatures and it can also categorize the disease heterogeneity using there are different like 48 biological signatures which can be derived including signatures which are based upon the validated uh, PAM50 and inflammation uh, related signatures which is we call as TIS assays. So, you get a, a, a in the intrinsic subtype, you get a risk of recurrence subtype, then you get a genomic risk score as well as a TIS score that is tumor inflammation signature score which will give an indication of whether the patient will respond to immunotherapy or not. So, therefore, it gives a risk of recurrence as well as a genomic risk score. It gives, it can give different detailed profiles of TNBC subtypes, it can derive survival data and it can also uh, give more information upon the Claudine uh, low signature. So, it gives a lot of information uh, with just one sample. So, one because one can study uh, about uh, 776 genes, so that is the amount of information that one can derive by using this particular test. Now, another important aspect of this test is it does not require uh, an enzymology base, there is no enzyme involved in this particular uh, test. So, therefore, it is a hybridization based test, therefore, can work on highly degraded samples also because there are no enzymes involved. So, to kind of which can inhibit, which can get inhibited due to the, uh, you know, due to the quality of the FFPE, sometimes it can, uh, it can actually um, hamper the enzymes. Whereas, uh, in case of this particular protocol, there are no enzymes involved. It is simple, simple hybridization based technology. So, therefore, can work very nicely on highly degraded FFPE specimens also. So, if you look at there are 776 total genes out of which 
two of them are validated that is validated based upon the PAM 50 and the TIS signatures which is validated. But along with this, along with the validated assays, you also get the different nine different breast cancer biological signatures and we also get 24 novel tumor immune activity related signatures. A lot of information can be derived by using the BC360 panel for targeted therapy. So, therefore, you have the validated of course, is the PAM50 subtype signature and the tumor inflammation signature. But apart from that, the nine different uh, breast cancer related biological signatures include the Claudin low signature, the TNBC signature, the CDK46 signature, differentiation signature, breast cancer and P53 signature, BRCA signature, HRD signature, cell addition signature, all these information can be derived. And then also some of the novel components can be derived that is based upon the immune response. Based upon the gene expression, one can predict the immune response as well as the tumor signatures which uh, kind of contribute to the novel aspects which we can derive out of a particular tumor. So, as I mentioned the BC360 panel is able to give the intrinsic uh, subtypes based upon the PAM50 signatures along with that it can give a lot of information about the different signaling pathways as shown in the slide like the ER pathway, PI3 kinase and the AKT mTOR pathway, ER then the RAS pathway, the JAKSTAT pathway, HRD pathway a lot of information can be derived about individual pathways. So, little bit about the uh, ROR that is the risk of recurrence and the genomic risk. So, the scale that uh, we obtain is between 0 to 100 and the individual. So, therefore, this is the individual's probability of recurrence within 10 years of diagnosis. So, this particular score will tell what is the probability of recurrence for these women within 10 years of diagnosis. So, it is calculated by comparison of expression of 46 genes in the samples with the PAM50 centroids to derive four different correlation values. Then these are then combined along with the PAM50's proliferation score and the tumor size to derive the risk of recurrence score. So, these are then combined with the PAM50 proliferation score and the tumor size to derive the ROR score that is the risk of recurrence score. With the nodal status, they can then get categorized as low risk, intermediate risk or high risk. And the genomic risk score and the ROR score is essentially the same. Many, many times they are very, very common. But the only thing which is different between a genomic risk score and ROR score is the tumor size component. So, in the risk of recurrence score, one will include the tumor size, whereas in the genomic risk score, you would not have the clinical component at all. It is something which is just based only on the gene expression. And then you can have uh, some information derived for the tumor inflammation signatures. That is, if you want to identify if a tumor is a hot tumor or a cold tumor. So, if it is a hot tumor, then you know that it is amenable to immunotherapy, whereas cold tumors are not, which is like uh, if it is immune excluded, then a therapeutic intervention may not be possible. Whereas, if it is immune infiltrated, then a, a, the, the response uh, to um, immunotherapy may be there. So, therefore, this is assessed by uh, looking at the expression of 18 genes, which give the uh, gene uh, uh, that is gene tumor inflammation signature. So, uh, there are about 18 genes listed in the slide. So, these 18 genes uh, expression are studied, which help us understand whether the tumor will respond to immunotherapy or not. So, there is a score which we derive, which actually measures the peripherally suppressed adaptive immune response and has also been show, uh, shown to correlate with the response to checkpoint inhibitors cut. So, this particular test uh, measures the peripherally suppressed adaptive immune response and has been shown to correlate with the response to the checkpoint inhibitors. So, we have been able to do this test in about 500 patients so far. So, how we normally go about this is we take the paraffin block from the patients, we isolate the RNA, total RNA and then we run the gene expression code set for the RNA hybridization and after the hybridization is done, then it goes to encounter prep station. From the PEP station, it goes for encounter flex analysis and there are two softwares which are available that is the Nsolvel and Roslin which we use for data analysis. So, we are able to analyze whether the tumor falls under the luminal A category or luminal B category with respect to tumor size, what is the tumor size and then with respect to TIS score, the breast cancer proliferation score, 
the genomic risk score and risk of recurrence is derived using this particular test. This part of the slide actually shows the encounter assay uh, procedure. The whole procedure is kind of automated. So, only up to the hybridization we have a manual intervention because after that the machine does it automated. So, you have the fixed uh, tissue which is from the paraffin uh, embedded and then one has to cut sections out of this and isolate RNA. And then once RNA is isolated, then the QC has to be run, uh, which determines the concentration and the purity. So, once the RNA is pure, then it is mixed with the coat set, which is uh, supplied along with the with the kit with the kit that is it comes in the form of a kit based upon the panels chosen. So, BC 360 basically is a 776 gene. So, one has to run the BC 360 coat set the hybridization happens overnight in the thermal cycler and then the next day morning the, the sample is put in the prep station and from prep station it goes to the uh, digital uh, data analyzing uh, instrument and then the digital data is acquired and then analyzed. So, if you look at the, uh, the entire summary of the invasive breast cancer diagnosis, so we have to understand uh, one has to look at the biomarkers using immunohistochemistry or it can be biomarkers which are studied using nucleic acid based testing or it can be biomarkers which are derived by immunohistochemistry, FISH or, uh, or uh, SISH. So, therefore, uh, what happens is when a invasive breast cancer diagnosis is done, one has to decide whether it is qualifying for a germline testing or whether it is not qualifying for the germline testing. So, whether it is running in family or whether it is sporadic. So, once that is done, then if it is qualifying for a germline testing, then the straight away the patient has to undergo BRCA1 and 2 germline testing by NGS. And then um, once it is qualifying for the germline testing, then one has to look at the histopathological evaluation of tumor to identify what is the status of ER and PR and what is the status of HER2. So, this is becomes mandatory. Suppose it is not meeting the criteria of germline mutation testing and it is a sporadic tumor, then still histopathological evaluation is important to understand the ER, PR expression and HER2 expression. So, and then once this is done, then one undergoes uh, additional predictive and prognostic assays. So, these are all the different assays that we saw. There are multi gene sequencing assays, gene expression assays, then there are K67 gives the proliferation index of a tumor, and PDL1 tells you how much of response to immunotherapy the patient will have. So, this categorizes the summary of how the breast cancer testing uh, can happen. So, in today's session, we have looked at what is breast cancer, what is the epidemiology of breast cancer globally and in India. We have understood how the breast cancer is diagnosed, what are all the modalities, how the breast cancer treatment happens, how it is managed and then what are all the prevention strategies and then uh, what are all the biomarkers, what is intrinsic subtyping, how this is being done and what are all the different uh, gene expression assays which are important for risk prediction and to predict prognosis in breast cancers. Thank you.